Welcome back to another episode of Seek a Psychology. Today we're going to talk about a small bit of a, a kind of conflict that happens with a lot of our content, happens with a lot of other kind of YouTubers or just a lot of people who talk about training, right? And this is the conflict between kind of staying motivated in training, but also being told that you have to do all the monotonous, boring shite that makes you actually better at the sport you're doing. So when we think about it most of the time, a lot of us are just going to be motivated or happy to go training because of big PBs, uh, making rep maxes, doing things in training we weren't able to do before. So even if it's with accessory work, doing an extra few reps, doing it with a heavier dumbbell, doing it with more band tension. The unfortunate kind of conflict here though is that in all of our training programs or in most training programs in the world, if you want to make progress, you have to do monotonous stuff 70, 80, 90% of the time. So when we talk about monotonous things, for most of us, that's things that clearly don't have higher intensity, may not have higher frequency, and may not have higher volume than the previous weeks you've been doing. It involves staying sub-maximal or under previous best for almost all of the training cycle. And then we also at the same time kind of glorify these periods where people are training really hard, people are going to the gym every day, people are squatting all the time, and people keep getting better and better and better. The classic kind of case of this is that everyone loves talking about like Bulgarian training systems, everyone loves doing them to a certain extent until they explode. And yet again, on the opposite end of the scale, on this channel and loads of other channels, we just tell people to go slowly, be conservative, take the wins when you can get them but it's like this clear kind of contrast from left to right we glorify one thing in one hand and we say it's crap in the other right so we think about most of the kind of rhetoric around this or how people like to phrase this in their head typically say like okay take the small wins right so take the rep maxes be happy that your 5rm is heavier than it was this time last year be happier that your 3x3 three three or 5x5 five five is bigger than the last time you did it. Uh, take the small increases in the amounts of your training, like you're able to train four days a week now and be productive over all those four days versus three days a week and kind of one or two bad days added in. And then we also just tell people to kind of like be happy. It's part of the process, this kind of like process driven mindset. That's what most of the literature backs up, by the way. So when we sit on here or when you listen to other people's videos and they talk about a process mindset, they talk about a growth mindset, that is the, that's the appropriate method. That's the, the data-driven, peer-reviewed study uh, direction that we're being told to go in. But it's very, very difficult to find how to apply that. So if you're an athlete and you're going to the gym normally four times a week, it can be very monotonous to sit there and say like, okay, for the next four months, I'm not going to do anything more difficult or heavier than I've done before, or I'm not going to train more than I've trained before. I'm not going to add a huge amount more volume than I've done before. So what do people usually tell you to do? Well, there's two different camps. One camp says like, you've got to train hard. You've really got to push yourself. You'll know when you hit your limit because I guarantee you haven't got there. That's, that's one camp. The second camp is the the super conservative, super slow, and it's like giving a marshmallow to a five-year-old. Um, so the marshmallow to a five-year-old, they're going to eat it. Even if you do like a delayed gratification piece where you give two five-year-olds one marshmallow each and you tell them, okay, if I come back in an hour and it's not eaten, you get two marshmallows uh, in a very, very small proportion of the population, you'll get somebody who's able to delay gratification most of the time you give a marshmallow to a five-year-old, it's going to get eaten. And it's very true in the case of, of adults as well. When you allow somebody to go heavier, when you give someone a bit of autonomy with their training or their programming or even how they approach sessions, they'll usually go about eating that marshmallow right away, right? They get the gratification. They do 100 kilos on the bench for max reps instead of doing uh, four by eight at 80 kilos. So what do you do in these cases? Well, there's a few things you do. The first thing, and this is by far the most important thing, uh, is plan. Plan excessively, plan aggressively, 
plan every single aspect of your training plan when you'll eat around your training plan how much sleep you'll get during the week around your training even if you live in a war zone right or even if you live in a a world where you get called into work at last moment's notice and you have to do 12 hour shifts multiple days per week you still put as much effort into planning as you can physically muster right when you're driving in your car you're thinking about planning when you're writing out your your training in your diary you're thinking about it when you're printing off a seeker strength pdf you're printing it off and you're annotating on the sides of the spreadsheets you're you're really really focusing on all the aspects of the plan why would we want to go into so much detail on a plan that could possibly change well the most important reason is the more detail and the more intensity we put into our planning when the plan does eventually change we're left with more of the structure so i'm going to give you the example now of i'm squatting three days a week and I know that I might get called into work early on one or two of those days. If I've planned all of my accessory work, if I've planned out all of the recovery I need, if I've planned out the amount of time I need between sessions, even if I completely miss one session then, and I'm sitting at home and I might just have 40 minutes, I'll be able to say, okay, look, I already have that accessory work written out. It's quad Nordics and banded hamstring curls. I can go and hit that accessory work still get some positive work done in the direction of me getting a better squat, even though I haven't been able to get to the gym. So there's a famous uh, Cork soccer player, Roy Keane, who had a saying, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And it's very much the case with training programs. If you are in the position now where you know the next few weeks or the next few months, like especially coming into summer up here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's very, very easy for you to just say ah, I won't go to the gym tonight because everyone's going to the beach or oh, I was out drinking at the weekend and I don't feel like going to training on Monday you know the plans are going to change a bit more frequently so put more effort into the plan the last point on planning is the more effort you put in the less likely you are to tear it up and just throw it out the window at the end so if it's something that you just kind of scribble down or something you talk to your training partner about saying like okay going to do tens for a few weeks and then it might go to eights and sixes then it might go to fours and twos that's virtually no capital put into that plan you haven't put any numbers next to it you haven't put any timeline or or scale to the to how far you want to get with this that's a very easy plan to just throw out and end up doing heavy triples on day two because girf is doing heavy triples and you want to go with him the next part then is talking about what training actually is Training isn't about achieving things. Uh, for the most part, it's not about like gradually or, or continuously getting better. For a lot of what training is, for a lot of our sessions, we're doing weights we've lifted before. If you're a runner, you're running times you've ran before. If you're a high jumper, you're jumping heights you've jumped before. And for the most part, it's ingraining things in. So it's gradually building volume. It's gradually building intensity over the course of a long period. It has these fluctuations. It has the peaks and troughs that we all expect to see. And we just need to understand from the outset that if I'm going to train for the next four months to try and get in shape, I'm going to be doing things most of the time, unless I'm a complete noob or unless I'm really, really out of shape. Most of the time I'm in the gym and I'm training or I'm on the field or I'm on the court and I'm training. I'm not doing things I haven't done before. Even if it is uh, an extra rep or an extra set onto it, it's probably a weight I've done before. Even if I haven't done that weight before, I've probably done that same kind of rep pattern as I moved up towards a heavy weight. So just understanding that this is training. It's not competing. It's not achieving. It's just training. It's the physical act of trying to bring out adaptation. And we don't necessarily need to have direct progression every single session. The last thing I'm going to talk about on this piece then is just what we need to expect, right? So what I'm going to look at now is we're going to look at a sample kind of training block. We're going to put in 100 kilos on the snatch. We're just going to quickly scroll through. So you'll see this is just a four week block. You'll see on the graph here, it's really, really clear, right? Even though the reps might be a bit higher at the start, they're tapering off towards the end. This is a standard concurrent training style we're in a a normal phase of training 
and we don't go super maximally once. You shouldn't expect to go super maxly unless this is our kind of once a quarter, once every third of a year. If you're a power lifter, you're probably expecting to go maxly twice a year at the absolute max or once a year in a standard training year. So you talk about powerlifters having to plan longer, like it, it's something that frequently comes up when myself and Owen are talking on the channel. We talk about powerlifting is just such a longer road. The time scales we talk about are longer, the weights are bigger, the amount of volume you have to accrue is much larger. So then obviously you max out a lot less frequently. This means that you have powerlifters competing three times a year, um, in some cases four times a year, and never ever fully maxing out all three lifts except for once. That's what good training protocols are. That's what good setups are. Now, everyone's going to be talking immediately at this point about you'll see certain powerlifters, you see powerlifters training under us who hit PB after PB after PB every few weeks, every few months. And this is really, really good, right? But you have to understand the position certain people are in, right? You get people coming in who are in really good shape but mightn't be in necessarily spectacular shape for lifting you'll also get people coming in who might be really genetically talented but may not necessarily have pushed themselves in a powerlifting context too hard and you'll also get people who are just relearning different movements or you might get someone who, who changes and tweaks a few things and then suddenly they might have pushed something really really hard in the past we change some technical aspects we change how that movement is being done and you start to see PB, 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 PB. But that's not realistic for, for most of the time we're training. Most of the time we're training, we're expecting to do sub-maximal loads at reasonable volumes, at reasonable frequencies and intensities. And that's how we just gradually accrue volume. We accrue that adaptation energy. Finally, to conclude this video, right? I know I've talked about what we say I know we talked about what other people say, we talked about what you probably have done, talk about the wrong things to do, talk about the right things to do. And I'm just going to give you some quick take home points, right? The first of these is framing. If you're in a position right now where you know this is an issue, you know you go maximally too often, framing is a really good tool, right? I'm not going to go into framing in too much detail now. It's something you can look up. I think we actually have a video, one of the Seeker Psychology videos on it. Framing is a, a cognitive tool. It just very, very simply changes how we think about something. So um, it usually takes three to five minutes. Go and look that up if this is something you're struggling with right now. The second thing then is to reassess, right? So reassess what you need to get from a training session. A very good way, in my opinion, of reassessing is, is something like a training journal. So you can go in. I like to, people to do it before training and then maybe they'll add a bit to it afterwards. But before training, how I'm feeling, what I'm expecting to get out of the session and what a good session would look like. That's three lines. That will take you 20 seconds unless you are a lefty and can't write correctly. The last thing then, and I think this is probably one of the most valuable things, is talk to other people, right? Um, training partners are invaluable. They don't even have to be doing the same sport as you. They don't have to be in the same country as you, right? But talk to people, figure out what their sessions are like, what their opinions around each session are like, and you'll start to pick up on things, right? You'll start to pick up on, okay, uh, geez, he hasn't got her, she hasn't got heavy in a long time. She's still making really good progress. The classic example I'd always see is like when you're training or coaching or just being in, in kind of CrossFit gyms, and you'll see weightlifters frequently training off in the corner. You'll hear members saying like, she never maxes out. She never goes really heavy. Yet her technique is so much better than yours. And her 1RMs are so much heavier. So this is the thing, like talk to other people, see what other people do and just glean a small bit of, of kind of enjoyment from it, but also glean a small bit of, of cognitive capital from it and just be slightly smarter with your training. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to see some of the training programs we talked about in this video, go to seekerstrength.com. Just go to the shop there and you'll see training programs for weightlifting, powerlifting, off-season athletes. You'll also see a link for our back squat programs, pull programs, and press programs. And then finally, what you'll start to see is you'll see a place where you can go and get consultancy or you can apply for one-to-one -one training. We're pretty blocked up with one-to-one -one trainings at the moment, so I would highly recommend 
getting an email in there if you are looking for a spot and we'll try and sort you out. Thank you.